I'm going to grab my coffee. I'll be back. Okay. Um, stand by. I need to send something to Trish real quick. Uh, this phantom note taker is going to take notes. Um, yeah, I'm trying it out for you, Ellis. So it's taking oh, notes okay. right now. And I'll send you um, the results of this. And then, you know, do with it as you wish. Um, it's not always very accurate. Lots of typos. But it gets you a good starting place for notes. It's easier to fix typos than to start out from zero. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And let me go ahead and get started here. Um, first off, welcome. Welcome to members. Welcome to new folks. And I'll make some introductions here in a, in a moment. I just really wanted to start by opening up. <clears throat> On Saturday, I was actually in the process of negotiating a spot for the UDC's um, campaign office. I was talking with a longtime realtor here in town who owns a lot of real estate and was actually able to convince him that it might be a good thing. He hadn't done it for 50 years and was ready to consider renting a spot um, in downtown Livermore, right next to the donut wheel. <laughs> and Midway through Saturday, I started getting texts from him saying, well, are you going to have police security around this building 24 hours a day? And of course, my response was, no, I have insurance, but we can't guarantee police presence 24 hours a day. And then a couple hours later, then there was the assassination attempt on the ex-president. So needless to say, that deal fell through. Um, the fear of political violence is real. It's affecting our ability to get a campaign office. So if you know anybody who has a space to rent or wants to share office space as a political candidate, um, I have the funds, I have the insurance, I have the wherewithal, I have my physical body volunteering but now we have the fear of political violence. Um, it's unacceptable. What happened is unacceptable. But after the shooting, you know, I saw people, Trump supporters, flipping off the camera, flipping off the press, blaming Democrats for this, even though it's their policies, their policies on gun control, their policies on assault weapons um, that I believe was the cause of what happened this weekend. You can blame political violence if you want, but if we didn't have 20 year old kids, 20 year old abused kids having access to assault weapons, this thing would have not happened either. I wanna share something that Bernie Sanders said he was on Meet the Press this weekend. And I know a lot of you guys don't like Bernie, but I tell you, he hit the nail on the head. He said, political violence in any shape and form is unacceptable. Take a deep breath and remember what politics is all about. It's not about radical rhetoric. It's about a series of conversations about policies. It's kind of a boring discussion. Serious discussions about serious issues. Um, he says, harsh rhetoric doesn't have a place in politics. What we need is a nation. What a democracy about is not radical rhetoric. It's about a serious discussion where we are as a nation and how we go forward. Um, he also continued with, you know, what are these serious issues? Starting with climate change lowering the costs of health care, a woman's right over her own body, improving health care and Medicare for all. Look at what the Republican Party is doing. Don't listen to what they say. Watch what they do. 
And with that, I'd like to open up tonight's discussion. Um, tonight, I want to welcome first new members. Um, I'm gonna take a look at the screen. Do we have anybody? Oh, I know, I know, where is he? Um, Steve, do you wanna unmute yourself? Um, I wanna introduce somebody here tonight who will be coming back to our club to seek endorsement. But I wanted to open up the floor just to make a brief introduction. Um, Steve Lanza will be running for Chabot and Las Positas Community College. Um, and I'm gonna let you announce that yourself because I'm gonna mess it up for you, Steve. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure. So I actually uh, filed today. So I have filed to run, I'm an incumbent. So I'm the current Area 7 uh, trustee for, so Livermore, predominantly in Livermore, a little bit of the south, uh, southeast corner of Dublin and San Ramon uh, as it's drawn, uh, representing this region, this area for uh, the Chabot Las Vegas Community College District. So I've been on the district for just shy of, well, Let's see, actually, it's July. So I keep thinking just shy of two years, but that will be at the end. So I'm uh, about 18, 19 months in and uh, and getting great. Uh, it's a great experience and it's an incredible organization. And so I'm enjoying it uh, and feel like I'm contributing. So I have uh, a Silicon Valley background and I'll share most of this later. So I, I'll keep this brief because Jackie says I'm coming back next next month. But um, I look forward to learning from all of you. I know uh, several of you uh, on the call already and uh, look forward to uh, meeting and learning from many of you as we uh, go through this process. So thank you for having me tonight. Thank you. Um, anybody else new to the club that wants to introduce themselves have not been to a meeting or Andrea, go ahead, unmute yourself. Tell us about yourself. Hi, I'm Andrea Burnett, and I live in Dublin, and um, I'm glad to be here tonight. I, So far for campaigns, I'm an I'm a avid postcard writer, but um, other than that, I haven't uh, been to uh, any Democratic clubs besides Rossmore um, and their events, and so I'm glad to be here. I'm a retired court reporter. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And if you haven't already done so, you can go to our website and sign up for our MailChimp distribution. If you sign up under our website, you'll get on all of our listings, all of our notifications. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, anybody and also, else? That's... And also for the candidate, uh, my father was uh, one of the founders of Shabok of Las Positas. Um, he was the Dean of Students. Good, good, and welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the club. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I don't see any new other new faces out there. Um, tonight for our agenda, um, we will be um, going over some of the current updates of what's happening in the committee. I did invite Igor Trigeb. Um, here tonight, he may jump on the call later, who is the chair of the Alameda County Party to talk about the convention that's starting. The DNC convention starts August 19th through August 22nd, and it's in Chicago. Um, the RNC convention started today. If you saw that, they picked their VP uh, nominee. Um, it's gonna be JD Vance, a Senator from Ohio. Um, he was once a no Trumper or a never Trumper and boy, has he changed his tune today. So, um, that's what's happening at the RNC. Um, the first thing we were going to discuss or vote on is the Renters for Justice Act. Then we will have Kelly go ahead. Uh, she is running for reelection for uh, Pleasanton School Board. So we'll have her speak and we'll endorse on that. And then after we vote on these two issues, we will be stopping the recording and having everybody have an opportunity to um, just freely talk without it going out on the internet and talk about this election, talk about the recent events of this weekend, 
or anything else you want to get off your your chest. Um, so first, first up is the Renters for Justice Act. Um, I did send out um, that information to all members. Um, in essence, what what the act would do is strike Costa Hawkins from California law altogether. So it's that entire section of Costa Hawkins in its entirety. Um, we did send that out to club members. I wanted to open this up for some discussion for a few minutes of people who speak for that bill and people who speak against the bill, and then we'll open it up for a vote. Um, first off, is there anybody that would like to speak in support of the Justice for Renters Act, striking cost, uh, 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 cost of hockey? Uh, Secretary has a question. Uh, yes. We're going to vote on a resolution, or what are we voting on? That we endorse or do not endorse this bill. Okay, so, so it's it, endorsement. Okay. It's an endorsement. So, I just to get that straight. so it would just be an endorsement on the um, Justice for Renters Act if we so, you know, vote to do that. Um, is there anybody that would like to speak in support of the Justice for Renters Act? And if you don't know, if you didn't read through it, let me just give you a highlight. Um, last month, we heard from special guest speaker, Daniel Anderson. Uh, the Costa Hawkins Rental Act is currently a part of California state law. It was enacted in 1995. It places limits on municipalities rent control ordinance. Costa Hawkins, in essence, pre, uh, exempts single family homes, condos and what they deemed new build. And the new build is um, property or apartments built after the act was enabled in 1995. Um, or in the case where there's rent control like in Berkeley or Oakland, any rental units built after 1995 under Costa Hawkins would be exempt, but also with regard to cities with existing rent control, the act counts as new construction, any built after the um, rent control ordinance was put into place. So that's what's in current law. Um, if enacted, this bill would strike all that language from the California law. In essence, giving cities the ability to enact rent control on single family homes and condos and newer build buildings. So with that said, I'm gonna open it up again. Anybody want to speak in favor for Costa Hawkins? Uh, I would like to, to say something. Um, strike it, yes. I would like to say something. When I asked uh, Daniel uh, Anderson last month, who was sponsoring this? He said that the union that represents hotel workers was sponsoring, that is getting the signatures, and this is several million dollars to get signatures, uh, enough signatures to put it on the ballot. And he said that the uh, hotel workers union is doing this because this will provide considerable amount of low cost housing, which hotel workers want. We're talking about the maids and the people who work at the hotels, which are a majority of the employees. So my feeling is uh, we don't get into the, the weeds very much, but knowing who's sponsoring it and why tells us very much about what this, this bill would be. So uh, I'm going to vote for it. The one thing I found when I did a little research, you know, I was all gung ho ready to go with endorsing it. And I have to um, preface that with that I'm a landlord. I have single, two single family homes that I rent. And, you know, I don't have, I don't have a fear of rent control because I 
charge fair rent and I'm good to my tenants and I would always be in compliance even under the strictest rent control. But what concerned me was when I did the research, I found that Buffy Wicks of all people in Oakland is against this. And I went, Buffy Wicks, really? The most, one of the most progressive people in, in, um, in our legislature. And what her reasoning against it was, she feared that it would stifle construction, that there would not be the incentive to build new construction if you couldn't charge a higher price than the older construction or single family homes that tenants or landlords, small landlords might get out of the business of renting single family homes, might just sell them instead. So I guess, you know, that concerned me when I saw that Buffy Wicks was against it. Um, and I guess I kind of like to open it back up to maybe some folks that are, like I see Trish online, you know, somebody that's been in city government that knows a lot of this stuff, what their thoughts are on, yeah, you know, this bill. Yeah, I can, I can, I've, I've been looking here, hang on a minute, let me. Try to, I'm trying, okay, there we go, sort of ish. Um, I've thought a lot about this, and honestly, I, I have, I have very mixed feelings about rent control in general for exactly those reasons. Um, is, uh, I, I think the goal, there's, there's two competing issues that I see. One is, how do you prevent uh, how do you how do you encourage legally, you know, through law, landlords to be the kind of landlord you are? So that is a public good. That's what we would want in general. In, you know, from our from our laws is that everybody's not going to act honorably. So how do we make that happen? The second piece is. If the problem is really we're not building enough, and boy, do I have things I could say about that, <laughs> um, and about um, you know people who work really hard to prevent that from taking place, um, and have worked you know and continue to do that, you know th that to me is really important. That is where the energy should be spent. So that's the second hand, and the third hand is but we want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. And so I just go round and round with that. Um, I, I, I just, I, I, I feel like this is not the right answer. I also, again, I'm worried that what I'm trying to do is make the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's not very helpful, but it's what I can offer. Others. Other comments? Do we have any other city council people on tonight? I don't have the full view. I'm, I'm here, Jackie, but I just got on a few minutes ago. Are you talking about the state? state? And we're talking, to, uh, hi, Valerie, thank you so much. Um, we're talking about the Justice for Renters Act. Mm -hmm. And one of the thing that caught my eye is Buffy Wicks is strongly against it um, because she thinks that it will stifle construction that it would curtail, you know, all these people that want to get in to build and, and because it would expand, it would get rid of the exemption for single family homes and condos. It gives the cities the ability to do rent control, but it, um, it has the whole, um, it, it's trying to defer to detour from vacancies. So if you have, let's say I had my sister renting from me for half the price and then I go to rent to the public, you know, I'm kind of stuck with the price, whatever I rented to my sister because um, it, it's, it's based on the last tenant. It doesn't matter if, you know, you're giving the tenant a deal or not. So I, I I was kind of just asking some of the people that are city council, you know, what are your thoughts? You guys are the ones who have to deal with these house, housing issues. Do you feel this legislation is going to make it better or worse? 
Yeah, you know, and I personally, I've heard both sides of this argument. And uh, I don't know, I, I do have some mixed feelings. I, I know I have heard that it will deter housing from being built. I'm not sure if that's a valid argument or not. It, it might be, I don't know. Um, but I also know that, you know, Oakland and Berkeley and San Francisco have rent control. And one of the things we talk about is our uh, younger generations um, not being able to afford the rent in the Bay Area. So, uh, you know, in, in general, I'm in favor of rent control, but as a, um, you know, I know the arguments against it, I, they might be some valid arguments. So it, it it's a bit of a tough one, I guess. And I think you'd have to really just evaluate how you feel on it with all of the, you know, both both sides of the issue being presented. But I'm not sure how, <laughs> to be honest, I'm not sure how I feel about it because I see some pros and cons on each side of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, other comments? I can I can chime in while I'm not a city council member. I can chime in as a planning commissioner in Dublin. Um, kind of, it's also some of the stuff I do around student housing advocacy. Um, what I've kind of heard in housing spaces and kind of regards to those comments through from folks like Buffy Wicks. Um, well, I just like, I guess I'll just start off by saying personally, I think one of the biggest things in terms of there's like being just an absolute need for reform around current like rent, rent control and cost of Hawkins. I mean, it is just such a, you have to go, a city has to go through such a political mudslide in order to have to get a rent control ordinance passed in the first place, especially when you think about the fact that really only certain cities, I feel like, especially of a certain size, right? You think of more urban cities like Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco have been able to have easily um, the ability to cobble a political majority towards pan passing a rent control ordinance. And I think in that way, um, that is, I think, one of the big differences that I think needs to be addressed, right? And if we want to seriously talk about being able to um, work with rent control um, across many jurisdictions across the state, right? That being able to do with the simple council direction um, that can take in community input without having to make it a very contentious, divisive, elective issue um, for each individual city as they talk about it. The main thing that I've heard in this concern, and this is something that I think I've been, that's been really hard for me to overcome, was not necessarily the fact that, again, it makes it easier to pass rent control through this, through the way that the ballot language is structured, but specifically the potential to stifle construction by the fact that there's no, by repealing almost the entire act, including specifically the, the language on rental rates and how those can be set, that some jurisdictions, particularly smaller ones that have already very low uh, percentages of renter households. So let's say take uh, Beverly, uh, even Beverly Hills is probably a not as good of an example, but you take one of the more exclusionary com communities like Woodside that has very few runner households. They could theoretically, this is the point I've heard, theoretically they could set uh, rental rates such that, I mean, you could basically have no rent increase from backdated from a certain point until a point where it basically would make it near impossible to uh, for any kind of rental project to pencil um, by not having, again, any kind of state guidance on how much you can set um, those rental rates um, or just how much you can cap those rental rates. So I think that's the main concern I've seen. And I haven't really seen any substantive response to that. So that gives me pause. Um, but again, that's kind of what I've taken from that. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have anybody else on planning commission? <laughs> City government of any kind. It knows these housing rules. Yeah, it is too bad they didn't just modify it, maybe change the date from 1999 to 2024 or something. You know, it, it would have made more sense. Um, and the other thing I thought of is how, how do they know what that vacancy, what the rate was before? Is, you know, who's going to track this? There are going to be some... Somebody coming from the city of Livermore knocking on my door saying, hey, your tenant moved out. <laughs> what was he paying? I mean, how do they even track that? That's another thing that's a very interesting. Trust me, staff is busier than that. <laughs> um, any other debate on that? For or against or questions? 
I guess I will add one perspective that I saw that I think was even more concerning than the pause from some more progressive legislators like Buffy Wicks was, I remember, I believe it was a city council member, a Republican city council member from Huntington Beach, really oh. going all in on this. And I was, that just, that, that gave me a little bit of pause. So I that, read that, I read that. Yeah. And, they, and what they were saying is they feel these coastal cities feel this will in essence kill new construction and that's why the the republicans are all for it because they figure yay now we won't have to build this stuff uh jackie as a procedure um i don't think that we're ready to make a vote on this because most of us have just shrugged our shoulders and say how should i know <laughs> and I, I think that would be more appropriate would be to take a vote on whether we're going to vote on this. Um, I guess that's calling the vote, or, or I don't know what the parliamentarian would like to call it, but uh, rather than stepping into something that most of us are kind of torn on, um, doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Unless we vote on it next meeting. Well, it, it, well even putting I it did, off, I don't think we're going to be smarter next meeting. I but, do have uh, it as a part of the ballot tonight. I mean, we could definitely, add, you could definitely abstain, and then there would be no vote counted towards it. Um, or members can vote yes or no. I could take it off there if the parliamentarian mm -hmm. and the members deem that. When, that's when, what we when you, do. you abstain, you really are, are not saying that I don't think the club should take a position on it. Let me make a motion to pull it from the agenda. I, uh, I personally don't feel that I have enough information to make a decision um, based upon what's been shared thus far. Uh, I would not be comfortable voting right now. So could we pull it from the agenda? Do I have a second? I'll second it. All do we favor? want a parliamentarian to, to rule in as to whether we can do this or not? Oh. That's been the question. And the and the answer is that there's no specific guidelines in our document that indicates that we are forced to follow any of the uh, guidelines or any of the items <laughs> in our agenda. Thus, we are free to take and change the agenda uh, at will, and thus we can uh, decide not to vote on this tonight. Can't we just table the motion? There is no motion. There's a motion. There was a motion to pull it from the agenda in a second. So correct. Do we have all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed. Okay, I will pull it from the vote um, from the uh, ballot for tonight. By the way, the the bill is it, it's an entirety in the email. So if you click on the link for that Costa Hawkins, you'll have the entire text of Costa Hawkins. So what they're proposing is that whole thing just gets stripped out of California law. So it has been sent to members. Maybe we could take this up again next month then since we pulled it from tonight. Jackie, can I Jackie, ask Trish your question? Has her hand up. Yes, yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, I, you said something about the Republican support for this, and I, I wanted to um, relate a, a hopefully brief story that I think is relevant that we should keep in mind as we go forward. And just to remind everybody that people on city councils are, are nonpartisan. Um, right after I got appointed, I was elected, I was elected, not appointed, to city council, um, I was appointed to work on uh, the CASA Compact stuff, which was around regional housing uh, allocations. Um, this was, you know, about you know four years ago or so. No, it was more than that. It was six years ago. Um, and um, what I realized is some of our bluest areas regionally are also some of the most anti-housing. And I started talking about people who talk blue and vote red or you know act you know vote blue and act red something along those lines and i said that to a council member from another another city um 
at, at one of the, you know, a Cal City's meeting or something along those lines. Very nice person. And she just looked at me and she said, I'm a Republican and I'm working on housing. So I think it's really important for us to understand that this is an area where what we do locally doesn't necessarily match what our uh, political affiliations are. Um, and I personally agree that, I absolutely agree that housing, you know, keep the, that housing is a democratic issue. Unfortunately, that's not always the way, or actually, I shouldn't say unfortunately. However, the way that people act in locally isn't all doesn't always match those ideological beliefs. So that's my story. I'm done. Thank you, um, Kelly. Did you have a comment? I know you had your hand oh, raised. Sorry. Yeah, I was trying to find myself. You. I kind of figured it out. Um, no, I was just going to ask a question. If um, if you wanted to reagendize it, if we could have someone from you know who is driving this come speak to the committee to give a little more proper presentation versus living, leaving it up to all of us to read literature on it. So it was just a clarifying question. Thank you. We did have somebody speak to this last month and it is- Oh, I missed it then. Yeah, and, and that's why I didn't rehash it again because it was discussed last month. Um, I sent the entire cost- of Yeah, I saw the, what you sent. Okay. Yeah, I I apologize. But, you know, this this week, I'm not very well organized right now after this weekend. Let's just say that. <laughs> My hair raising. No, um, so I'm just surprised that uh, if there was a previous presentation on it, there seems to be a mixed mixed view on it. So, um, yeah, so that was why I recommended to pull it from the agenda because it seemed to be a lot of mixed. You know, I want to make it right for if we're going to vote on it. So that's all. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And and it's, I'm glad. I, I'd rather pull it, then endorse something that ends up being a bad bill. So that's okay. Um, any other comments on this before we move on to our next segment? Yeah, I, I think it might be appropriate if we can find someone to speak, um, as Kelly said, from those people who brought the issue. So if we could hear from both sides, that'd be wonderful. Um, but I think we can also um, make it on the agenda to make a vote for next month. But if we decide that we don't have a sufficient base of knowledge in which to make uh, responsible decisions, we'll just cancel our vote next week also, or next month also. I will re-invite the, um, the same folks back and see if they can do their arguments and ask uh, answer any questions before we put that to a vote. I'll make sure we have those people available. Uh, Jackie, may I suggest you invite Dean Wallace? He's uh, regional director for Buffy Wicks and former president of this club. Actually, he's left Buffy Wicks' office. He's working- oh, really? He's working for somebody else up near SAC or something. Oh. I don't think he's in Buffy's office any longer. You know, but I could reach Jackie, out to her office directly. Jackie, this is Valerie. I, I think maybe talk to Igor at the Alameda County Dems. He has done a lot of work around rent control. He might have something to offer that might be valuable to this um, club. Just a suggestion. Thank you. And Eager was going to try to be here tonight, but he must have got caught up in something. He just texted me. And yes, he can't make it until later, he said. So um, he does support this um, initiative. So um, I don't know. It might be valuable. He does have our central committee. Um, might be valuable to hear what he has to say. So maybe for next month, perhaps. Will do. I will get his talking points if he cannot attend, at least. Um, any other comments? Anyone? Um, I am going to spotlight our next speaker. And um, first off, we have been doing some endorsements, local endorsements. I know that uh, there 
are still some folks pulling papers. And I actually had a complaint that I did an endorsement early before one of the Livermore folks filed. And so, Ron, I'm, I'm going to give you this task of maybe reviewing our, um, our bylaws to see if we are following, I guess, to ensure that we're, we're not endorsing too soon, that we have enough, that everybody's had a chance to file so that somebody doesn't come out after the fact and, and ask for our endorsement. Now, obviously, if they were a club member, they'd know we were doing these endorsements. So I always encourage people to stay in touch with the club. So if I'm doing something wrong, my club members can keep me on track. Um, but we're going to go ahead and move forward with our next endorsement tonight, even though, and Kelly, you're going to tell us if anybody's running against you. But um, our next member, our next um, endorsement um, is going to be for a member that has been with our club for a long time. Um, she is currently on the Pleasanton Unified School District. Um, she's asking for our endorsement for re-election. Um, this is for area three. And uh, Kelly, you, you, we know her. She's a longtime educator, a former adult member of the City of Pleasanton Youth Commission, and was first elected to the school board in November 2020. It's with great pleasure that I want to introduce to you Kelly Makashi for Pleasanton Unified School District. Wow, thank you so much, Jackie. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. I'm actually uh, zooming in from my homeland of Iowa. Midwest is uh, dear to my heart, but I'm super excited to be here tonight. Um, as Jackie introduced me, I am a, a four-year trustee uh, from Pleasanton Unified School District. Um, just a little bit about myself. I am from Iowa. Um, I grew up here, uh, did my initial education in the Midwest. Um, my initial opportunity was to teach in Houston, Texas as an art, educa art educator. Uh, inner city, and then also had an opportunity to teach in Trenton, New Jersey. From there, I had an opportunity to do professional development training uh, for Pearson Education, which, which is a universal uh, international publishing company, but I did professional development training with teachers in districts nationwide during an era of reform uh, for underperforming schools and districts. So I worked um, in places like Harlem, uh, Texas, California, Florida um, on reform, um, improving student achievement for uh, students who needed success. Students of, um, as we call marginalized now, but you know, African-American students, Hispanic students, allowing for opportunities at that time in CLB. From there, I uh, worked in the nonprofit sector as an executive director for a nonprofit raising a, um, adoption grant funds for orphans internationally. Also did online coursework and um, during COVID, I had an opportunity to get back into the education tutoring work, um, helping with um, online tutoring with all of the COVID relief funding. But most recently, I'm super proud to share that I'm actually back in the school district and I am uh, working in Fremont Unified School District in the Tri-Valley area as a community school coordinator. If any of you are familiar with the community school initiative, it's um, quite broad nationwide as well as statewide. And most recently I was able to award a 1.1 million five year um, uh, funding grant for one of the most neediest schools in Fremont and elementary school. So I'm back in the district, but uh, at the um, political level, um, I have three children in Pleasanton to high schoolers as well as the middle school. And I came into uh, Pleasanton um, elected in 2020, beating an incumbent. I'm super proud of that. But more importantly, during a time when uh, supporting um, our students during it, the pandemic and really making a difference. And the initial reason why I ran was I'm saying, hey, I'm doing all this great stuff nationwide, but I want to make a greater impact within our community. And I need to be really honest and say that um, our work, um, we've made a lot of progress since COVID, but there is much work to be done. And that's why I am asking for this endorsement. 
Um, I can share some of the successes I've been able to do since on the board. One of my most proudest achievements was um, serving as a delegate with the California School Board Association. I just got reelected. Um, and what's what really is um, impactful about that was uh, making policy change at the state level. So as a delegate on the school board, I would um, help um, with different policy policies to pass during uh, various um, elections. One of the policies um, that came for approval with the state was SB 114 with uh, the screener for dyslexia, which was passed and super excited that I was able to um, take part with, um, you know, actually going to Sacramento to speak um, at one of the committee meetings. Um, so that was one of the proudest um, opportunities that I had to serve on the school board was um, making an impact at the state level. Now, at the local level, I have had some amazing, um, great progress work. Uh, not only did we um, help bring back all of our students, we were the first uh, district in the Alameda County to um, come back um, after shuttering, um, but um, allowing to help support um, coming back for inter support, intramural sports for our students, as well as um, helping to fund for our athletics. It's been a challenge in our district in Pleasanton to fund our sports. Um, so I was very instr instrumental to help with some of the athletics for our students. Um, some other things that I was able to help um, progress towards with some of the changing of our policies at our uh, local level in Pleasanton. I served on many different committees within Pleasanton. Most recently, uh, the city district liaison committee. I've also been on the special education um, board called SELFA. Um, I uh, also have participated with the facilities committee. And I'm very, very engaged. Um, so. There's a lot of things I've done, but there is much work to be done. And um, it's some of the priorities that um, for my campaign actually haven't really changed since initially in 2020, but right now, because many districts have deficits um, for in Pleasanton, we have, we're dealing with a 13 million um, deficit, which is huge. Um, I am going to stand for tighter control with the board, conservative fiscal responsibility. I feel that the board needs to take tighter, um, like a real deep analysis of, you know, where do we need to make changes? Um, I want to have more control um, in regards to, I feel there's an imbalance between administrative staffing and our teachers. Um, and I'm not proud to state that, you know, our district had two near strikes. And so another area that we need to work on is strengthening the relationships with our labor unions from the ground up. And that's actually part of the work with that I have um, been working in my day job is that transformative leadership where we're bringing everyone in the community, our students, the teachers, collaborative. So I also believe, and this was in my press release that came out, I really want to instill more of a collaborative um, decision-making process, that tr transformative change for long-term change. Um, our district has done many things well, but I feel that there have been sometimes a sense of feeling of top-down decision-making. Now, whether that's true or not, but that's been the feeling that many of our teachers um, have felt. So we there is a, a, an opportunity where we need to repair relationships. And I do feel that um, for someone, I've worked in districts nationwide, I understand how to get to um, really listen to our constituents, our students, our teachers, and begin to build uh, bridges to help make those decisions so that it's really more of a collective process. So another area that we do need to continue to work on is the disproportionality in particular uh, for our African-American students and our student, our Hispanic students continue to underperform academically, not only um, academically, but also the uh, disproportionate for classification of special education, as well as um, for suspension rates. Now, 
that has not changed since I've been on the board. So even despite the work that we have done with um, equity training, once again, we need to work more at the classroom level so that where the students are engaging and building those relationships with their teachers and how does that change into discipline practices? How to uh, really help support our students so it's less punitive? Um, there also needs to be more tangible strategies to help students at their own level so that every student is successful. In addition, Pleasanton graduates, high success, competitive. We have, you know, we have students who come to the board who started up their own companies and they're going, graduating off and going off to Yale. But I have three children in the district and I am proud of their achievements, but I wanna support the average student so that it is an opportunity of success for every student. And so that is definitely an area that, that the district can help strengthen. There's been great progress made, but we need to strive forward so that there is this less sense of competitiveness and that every uh, student feels inclusive within our school community. So those are a couple of, our, of the areas of priorities. Um, if you haven't heard, uh, we have a new interim superintendent, Maurice. Um, and one of the decisions as the board, I, you know, I can just mention that it was a board decision. I can't state individually, but uh, one of the areas for the drive was to identify someone who had previous superintendency experience, which I think is great for an interim, but one of the most important jobs that a trustee does. And one thing I would like to celebrate is my strengths is not only understanding policy change and driving direction and vision for the district, but it's also to hire and monitor the work of the superintendent. So that is one of the most important other points I would make is why it's important for me to continue to serve my work as a trustee is so that I can make an, a greater impact on that process. Um, because it may kind of overlap with the election. And this is a time where consistency, I understand policies, I understand the role of a trustee, and I am very excited to take part in that hiring process so that we can re-engage with our community to help take us forward because the next couple months in year or so is gonna be very challenging for our district to pivot the direction and come back with some of our deficit challenges. So uh, that's high level, some points. Uh, I really do support more of an open dialogue. So I'd like to open up if there's any questions at this point. And thank you for your time and your consideration for uh, my endorsement. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna remove the spotlight so it'll bounce around to the speaker view here um, for the recording. Um, any questions, anyone? Uh, I have my standard question, Kelly. <laughs> what is it in your background that motivates you to get so deeply into the educational sphere? It's very, very impressive, but uh, what makes somebody do something like that? Uh, what makes I... you dedicate your life to the educational system? <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it's really tender to my heart. I appreciate your question. Um, you know, I feel like this is something that um, I was a gift born with. I really, truly believe that the work is not done. I myself struggled as a student. I had a lot of anxiety with test taking. Um, I struggled and lacked confidence in my um, actual like high school career. And it was at a point when working with um, my grandmother who inspired to say, hey, Kelly, just pursue your or, you know, art passion and going to the arts. And um, I have that passion to really make a difference. And I feel that the work is not done. Like I said, um, you know, it's my life passion. I really wanna make a difference. Um, my current work at, at uh, Cabrillo Elementary I myself recently volunteered. It was not part of my job, but I went down back into my work, um, helping to teach art lessons during the summer because to help support that opportunity for extended learning, bringing back that creativity and that spark for students. It's Sorry, I got muted accidentally. Oh. <laughs> 
sorry, trying to unmute my computer that really drives me. And I am, um, I just feel like my work's not done. And in particular at the board level, um, that's why I'm thankful that the, um, the role is four years because I think your first year or two takes a while for you to kind of like figure out what you're doing and you know, the work's not done. And I'm really proud of our accomplishments, but the work's not done. And I'll be one of those that uh, I probably won't ever retire because that's that lifelong learning process. And I really enjoy what I do. And I'm very passionate about this. Thank you. Uh, Kelly, I appreciate um, you saying about the, uh, you know, being insecure in school. When I was a kid, I was a very sick kid and had pneumonia several times in, during elementary school and lost a lot of school time. And it was hard. It was really hard picking up, even if you just lose a couple weeks. Very difficult. So I appreciate that. And my question to you is, um, who's, is there anybody running against you? As of the last I looked, I could not find anybody that has claimed they're gonna run against you. Well, in all fairness, the uh, window to pull papers just started today. Oh. So um, I um, haven't heard of anyone specific who has committed to running. Um, so as of right now, um, I don't have anyone running against me. So um, the time for people to pull papers is by August 9th, but I have not heard of anyone specific who has officially pledged. Thank you. Trish? That's a fair question. <laughs> yeah. Well, I like I said, I got into trouble with one, one person running in Livermore City Council, and uh, we may down the road change that, but uh, I haven't heard of anybody as of tonight running against you, so we're proceeding with the vote tonight. <laughs> Trish? So uh, th these are really more questions of curiosity of issues that are, are that uh, I, uh, of, of the day, uh, so, so to speak. Um, first of all, I've heard very good things about you. So, you know, thank you we for- We chatted, thinking. we talked about by area elections before it happened in Pleasant. <laughs> we had a very long conversation and gave me lots of- Oh my questions. God, I remember. Yes, indeed. All right, so I'll take credit. Yay, Kelly. <laughs> but well, I have- <laughs> I want to ask and ask lots of questions when I don't know. I'm, I'm a lifelong learner and I, it's one of my tra traits I'm super proud of. But yes, what yeah, are your questions? No, I, I, I remember that conversation. I totally forgot it. And now, yes, no, absolutely. Okay, but I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Um, I'm currently reading the book, The Anxious Generation um, by Jonathan Haidt um, about the effect of smartphones. So I'm curious to know, how uh yeah what your what your thoughts are on how to regulate smartphones or if they should be regulated in the schools um so that's one question a second is um i can't remember if we talked about this um but we probably did because it comes up every time i talk about education my kids were in and out of school they were homeschooled they went to um one of them went to las casitas for for a while um hi steve um, and that connection between schools, uh, between particularly high school, but just kids and different modes of schooling, I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, and then the final one uh, is, is simply, um, I continue to be concerned. It seems to have fallen off the news for some reason at the moment, but the whole situation with the, the effect of um, uh, anti-Semitism that was on the rise, um, and I'm imagining hasn't gone away um and how and um since um you know that you've got a synagogue lo located in, in pleasanton i'm curious about that so that's a whole lot um all okay, right you know. so to start yeah. uh the effects of technology um smartphones broader uh with students is detrimental um i actually um as i i think i mentioned in my vita briefly high level um i've written courses online and one of the um uh, courses that I wrote and my audience are have been teachers for continuing professional development, but the research shows that um, technology usage, excessive technology us usage not only affects brain function and how students learn, but also can contribute to additional tendencies towards ADHD, 
I can attest as a parent of uh, three children um, and my youngest daughter, daughter was born with uh, the invention of the iPad. Um, and um, I can reflect back in some of uh, parenting errors of giving access to technology um, younger with their development, their dependency on technology and how parents have to navigate is horrendous. Now districts and in particular present, uh, Pleasant and I am fully aware of some of the professional development that uh, the schools will provide for parents, but there needs to be more. And the reason why I say that is because in this industry of education, especially with my work in ed tech, there is so much hype to say, oh, we got to do, the, you know, use this technology tool or this um, device to teach. And, you know, uh, in particular, the district adopted science textbooks that are all online. And that's actually a detriment because, you know, to learn about science lab work, you know, the students are learning it digitally versus hands on learning. So I'm more traditional saying, hey, let's go back to the basics. Um, and there is um, an entire um, reform that needs to uh, go forward, especially I know nationally and particularly state level and with a lot of companies with artificial intelligence, it's also another uh, really big endeavor right now. And we need to get some policies around um, artificial intelligence immediately as well to help uh, monitor the technology usage, because um, if it's not, if if we as policymakers are not careful, it's going to expand out of control before we can keep uh, up with it. So it's something that I do have great concerns about and something I'm very passionate about. Um, and that's one of the benefits of me being on the policy committee. That's one thing that I'll be working with Pleasanton if I'm reelected to put together a tighter AI and um, update our technology policies. So I think that's a great question. Um, in terms of the second question was modes of schooling. I'm a huge uh, proponent of uh, multiple avenues for learning for our students. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk and training about equity. Um, I have three children and I can per personally also attest that I have uh, three different children that learn completely differently. Um, and so um, we need to accommodate opportunities for every student and not every student may go to an Ivy League college they do better do better at trade school but what that means is that teachers need to have the tools to understand the learning needs of each student so they can uh, ensure that the instruction can meet the students where they're at and then thirdly you asked about um, some of the anti-sentimentism and racism and like just generally some of the challenges that our, our districts are dealing with I'm proud to state that um, most recently uh, Pleasanton did work collectively with our committee on revising one of our policies around um, the misuse of words like uh, the N-word. Um, and so we're working with our parents and community to um, help provide better policies, but more importantly, tools for our parents to help and teachers to help with our students for awareness. because. Um, even though that particular issue was brought up by our African-American families, we are ha having challenges with all, um, you know, ethnicities and religions. And it's really, once again, going back to that inclusive element, but how does that actually translate into practice and awareness that we need to accept everyone for their unique identities and um, endeavors and to help really address those issues because kids are being overly exposed and they're becoming indifferent. And so we need to go back once again, like I like to say back to the basics. It's like, you know, those general principles that we learned in kindergarten, but hey, um, we need to be respectful and understand that, you know, we all have something to contribute to our school community. Great questions, Trish. Thank you so much. And thank you for reminding me of a meeting. Now I just want to get together with you. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? I must yeah. say, um, before uh, before my time's concluded, uh, a huge thank you to Ellis. Ellis was one of the first persons I spoke to um, pre pre campaign <laughs> in way back in 2020, and uh, I must just 
a tribute, uh, a lot of advice and consideration from, uh, you know, just to really help bring me where I'm at. And, uh, you know, there's much work to be done. So, you know, I once again would appreciate the endorsement and by all rights, I will respect and understand if you need to hold the vote until later, but uh, I really appreciate the consideration. Any other questions? We My have a pleasure. <laughs> yeah, three Thank cheers you. for Ellis's training of a lot of candidates over the years. You asked the parliamentarian if he had any input concerning endorsement process. Did you want me to read from the um, Actually, what I, I think I'd like to do is look at because what what is what happened is um, in reading the independent, thank you, Joan, I think you're out there today. Um, I saw that there was another candidate for Livermore City Council. And we did not give that gentleman an opportunity to speak. And he is a Democrat. Um, so I'd like us to look at for future, not tonight, because we had this on our agenda. If you're a club member, we've been notifying you, you've been hearing our stuff. But going forward, I think I'd like to get a little closer to where like the central committee is with more formal, you know, going to the voter registrar and getting who is all the registered Democrats that are running and and try to do this after the close of filing. So I kind of like you to look at what would be required from our bylaws to make that happen, because we've been kind of we're we're pretty informal and obviously our club we love our club members people who come come to our meeting every month and are actively engaged um they know what's going on but democrats that don't know about our club may not so you know how we can get that word out to more people and engage more folks in this process and the other thing i want folks to remember is you can get endorsement from the central committee and that is your official democratic endorsement and that is coming up so um if you are running for office the central committee does reach out to everybody after filings closed and they will try to reach out to anybody who has um their paperwork or their email with the county um and and tr at, try to make a better effort at reaching everybody. So I kind of like you to look at that process, Ron, and see what we would need to do to make that happen going forward. I have uh, right in front of me our laws that I can, in two minutes, answer your question. Okay. Article seven of the bylaws is, is called endorsements. Section three is candidate endorsements allowed. It says, for candidate endorsements, the organization shall take all reasonable actions to contact all Democratic candidates for the office and give each candidate a fair allotment of time to present to the organization. There is no hard and fast time limits or statement that we must wait till all of the filings are in. There's nothing in terms of specific times or specific hard regulation. It says that we shall take all reasonable actions to contact all of them. The other, uh, as I read on, it says, furthermore, the endorsement vote shall be held after it is deemed likely that no additional candidates are expected to enter the race. And for all the candidates, for a single race to be dealt with simultaneously. So we're, we're advised by the bylaws to take all reasonable action and to make sure in our judgment that we are deeming likely that no additional democratic candidates are expected to enter the race. There's no hard and fast uh, demands, but it's just asks us to be reasonable and careful. Okay. Thanks, Rowan. Uh, uh, can I make a comment, please? Yeah, I think we have a couple hands raised first, Ellis. We have Charlie oh. and John, and then we'll come back to you. Uh, Charlie? So one of the things that I just wanted to bring up in regards to this is that a lot, a lot of these, like, because the timelines have changed, 
we've had a lot of our unions starting to do endorsements earlier, as well as we're trying, we've seen people at central committee even trying to push that earlier. Because if we're not endorsing until maybe August or September, it's almost entirely too late to be on, like to be on anyone's mailing stuff going out, to be having an effective campaign. Like if you're not already out door knocking, canvassing and running by like May, June, July and those time periods, like the, there's a lot of concern about how viable then is that candidate or that race. And so as we're, as the timeline starting to crunch and move further back, that's just one of the things a lot of the unions are wanting people to keep in mind is, is this earlier is what we're kind of needing for how this has shifted. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for that perspective. So, so we may be on the cutting edge of where they're going. <laughs> so join, join a democratic club today and stay in the loop. Sounds like, um, John. Unmute dear. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can you, can you hear me now? I can see myself now. All these, uh, pop-ups come up, uh, asking me if I want to, uh, you know, how many times I, you know, just this once, always, never. Um, so it's, uh, uh, but uh, Kelly, I um, have a question on the uh, school resource officers that the Pleasanton police, um, you know, currently has um, a memorandum of understanding, uh, or I should say there's a memorandum of understanding between the Pleasanton Police Department and the school district. Um, a lot of work was uh, put into that. Um, prior to that uh, being in place, I don't think there was a memorandum of understanding. Um, and I'm just um, wondering, um, you know, what your um, experiences um, or, you know, if that program is, you know, working successfully. I, I think back to, you know, there was a lot of work that was put into that by the, the liaison group between the um, the school district and the city. And, and one thing that struck me is that when parents were asked, a survey went out to three different groups. And when parents were asked, you know, do you want police on, you know, the Pleasanton School District campuses, um, you know, more than 90 percent of the parents said, yes, we do. Um, when the teachers and the administrators were asked the same question, once again, the, the percentage response was, was very high. Um, you know, 90, 95% of, uh, teachers and administrators wanted the police on campus. However, when the students answered that question, um, it was like 50, 50, I mean, half of the students uh, that responded to that question didn't want the police on campus. Um, anyway, the police are on campus, you know, right now. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, it, how that is working, one, and if you have any, um, you know, if you could share, if you have any personal opinions about, um, you know, police on campus. All right. Yes. Uh, great question, is John. Nice to see you again from the other day. Running to see yeah, you in jeans. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes, um, I am honored to state that I have served on the uh, city district liaison committee for several years. Um, I'm currently vice chair and uh, would like to state that um, I had the opportunity to, to be um, on the board when that MOU was finalized and approved. Um, so I can um, attest to the improvement of monitoring progress of the uh, relationship between the district and the city with school resource officers since that M MOU was in place. Um, you are correct. There was nothing in place prior to that. Um, that MOU was actually extended for one more year. And um, thankfully, the, the city is still currently assisting with full funding uh, for the school resource officers. Um, so that may change in the uh, near future due to deficit um, issues with both not only the school, but also at the city level. So the city and district are currently working and navigating uh, moving forward how the funding for the school resource or resort, ah, school resource officer will be funded, excuse me. Um, is it working? Yes. 
can it be improved? Absolutely. Um, and there is quite a few things that could be improved. Um, to your point, to, to the um, meeting of school resource officers at the student level, uh, the reason why it's 50-50 is that a lot of students don't quite fully understand what they do um, or the purpose of school resource officers. I think there's this general sense of safety from parents and teachers with the um, presence of a school resource officer on campus. Um, but the district needs to do a better job working and engaging with students at their level so that they understand that, hey, if the, there's an issue you have or there's a concern um, and you happen to see a school resource officer and you need to go talk to them. Um, there was a lot of discussion at the city district uh, liaison committee level and also at both the city and the district. Oh, I can't speak for the city level, but um, on whether uh, school resource officers should wear uniforms or not. And so that was a big debate because, you know, certainly for security, um, access to weapons if there's an emergency, but also being approachable. So um, to answer your question, yes, school resource officers are working, but um, my general feeling is that we need to continue to work with the city and the district uh, long-term to help support because um, there's been an issue also with employment for school resource officers, um, being able to hire and secure them in, the, um, in their office for employment because there's been a higher challenge. Um, so recruitment, sustainability of the school resource officers, and then really taking it more tangible of what their role is, because the MOU is also very, very clear of and what kind of circumstances should a school resource officer be contacted versus uh, being handled at the school level. Um, so I would like to state that um, there's a lot of debates for and against school resource officers, but what is it really about? It's about continuing to support students and where do they need help and support and the relationships between teachers, officers, and collective good for our students for success and having our students make good choices. Um, so kind of high level, I'd say there's still work to be done um, because with any program, there's areas of success and areas that could be for improvement. Great question, Great. John. Thank you for your detailed response. I try to be really honest. And <laughs> so, yes, I, I, um, I, you're right. I do get sometimes very detailed, but yes, thank you. Ellis? Um, <laughs> to get back on track, uh, Ron was talking about uh, requirements for endorsement. And I'd like to remind the club that we had an extensive debate about our bylaws, which previously allowed us to endorse more than one candidate for a specific office. And after considerable debate, we decided only one candidate per available seat. And that's the way our bylaws read. And um, it, it seemed to me we're, we're getting into that again with the situation that we're in, where uh, there's a possibility of having not interviewed uh, a Democratic candidate after having endorsed one already. And um, Basically, it would violate our rules if we even considered endorsing that second candidate. And I don't think I was saying that we consider that, Ellis. I'm saying that we consider making sure that um, potentially, that is potentially, and that, and, you know, there were some good reasons brought up why we wouldn't do that. Um, but potentially waiting and doing it after filing closed. Um, again, you know, what was stated by Charlie is um, candidates want to get a run, you know, get a start running. And 
I'm hoping that Democrats that seek our endorsement are members of this club and have been attending. And that's, you know, kind of my perspective. And I know Ellis said you were always a big one when you were president of trying to get that that first endorsement out there, you know, for, for our given candidate. And we were the first club to endorse Eric Swalwell. So, you know, sometimes getting that foot out the door right away is a good thing. Um, I just thought I'd bring it up because that was raised to me. And, and I also want to remind folks that the central committee is the official endorsement machine, I guess I should say. So if they endorse a candidate, um, the UDCs go to work for them, they raise money for them, they, you know, hit the ground door knocking for them. So if, you know, I also encourage people not only to seek endorsement from our club, which is wonderful, and we'll, we'll work hard for you, but also the central committee where you can get some actual help from the finance side as far as, you know, uh, door hangers and things like that. The committee will do those type of things for their endorsed candidate. So don't forget to file with the committee because that's also very, very important. Um, any other comment on that? Before we move on, Kelly, did you have any other closing comments before we move on? I did start to text folks out directly, members, um, a ballot to vote on. Um, if any no, members have not, thank you again for the uh, opportunity and consideration. It would be my honor, and uh, I'm uh, looking forward to this re-election to continue to serve our students in Pleasanton and, and to continue the hard work uh, because there's a lot of policy change and um, a lot of work that uh, lays ahead for um, our Pleasanton district, not only fiscally but uh, securing a long-term superintendent in place. So I'm looking forward to uh, re-election. Thank you for the consideration. Thank you. And is there any club member that did not receive a ballot? If you could raise your virtual hand, if you did not receive a ballot. It's, it should be in the chat. So you're looking in your chat window. If you don't know where that is, over in your Zoom screen, there should be some under the word or above the word more, some dot, dot, dot. And you should have a chat option there. If you did not receive your ballot, raise your hand and I will get it to you. Um, Jackie, uh, procedurally, do I abstain from the vote? No, you can vote for yourself. You're a club member. Oh, okay, just make sure. <laughs> if you want to abstain. <laughs> no, just I, I'm, I rule, follow rules. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're free to vote for yourself. Um, okay, what I'm going to do now. Um, I do have one endorsement, a couple uh, a couple notes before I cut off the um, recording that's that's going out on the the cloud, and then we'll have our our um, talk session. Um, first off, um, Eric Swalwell's campaign has agreed to um, set up a special meeting to meet with the Tri-Valley Dems. Um, I assume it's gonna be on Zoom. I'm still trying to uh, coordinate that with their campaign. Um, it's either gonna be the week of August 14th or the week of August 28th. So I don't have the exact date and time yet, but I just wanna put it out there. Um, as soon as we know, I'll send it to all club members. Um, and I do see a comment here from Joy. Um, she's stating that it doesn't seem reasonable to endorse candidates when we do not know who all the candidates are. So, um, um, Jackie, if I can, even though I'm not uh, a voting member, yeah. I believe that the next time you meet, so this may be related to the vote tonight, uh, but next time we meet, uh, all the candidates will have filed, right? Correct. So I believe Alameda County, everything is around August 8th or 9th, I believe was the 8th. 
Thank you, Charlie. So by next week, we should be clear anybody else who asks endorsements. And we did get a request to listen to the at-large candidates for Oakland City Council. So we're trying to dig up all the candidates for that race. Um, so mark your calendars, uh, watch for the note from the TV dims for uh, the special uh, event with Eric Swalwell. Um, also, uh, postcarding is going on with Livermore Indivisible. I will send that information out to all club members as well. So for those folks who would like to do postcarding, especially in the heat, it's gonna get hot again <laughs> next week. Um, look for that information coming from the club. And thank you to our partners, Livermore Indivisible, for all the good work that they do. Um, and then, Madhu, do you want to make your announcements before we get into our talk session? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, hi, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Thanks, Jackie, for handing off the mic. Um, I just wanted to give some updates on McNerney Field and where we're at. Um, so now we have resumed our phone banks. We have phone banks every Tuesday and Wednesday from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, we've also resumed our canvases. We have a canvas coming up this weekend, this Saturday in Pleasanton um, from 1 to 4. Uh, and we have another canvas. Actually, we're going to be at Charlie's canvas on the 27th. Um, and so we're just going to be there to support Charlie Jones for school board. And we're going to be knocking on doors with them. And it'll be a lot of fun. Charlie, Charlie thanks for dropping the link. Um, so please come out to one of them if you can. Uh, and if you can't walk or you don't want to, um, phone banks are really easy to do. Uh, I'll send Jackie the information, the sign up information, the dates and times after, and she could email them out to you guys. Um, but yeah, I just, I just wanted to give an announcement. Does anyone have any questions um, on the campaign? Okay, Jackie, I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And the day after Charlie's event, we have the Tri-Valley UDC event. Um, you will see that invitation come directly from me. This is not the Tri-Valley Dems Club, but this is the Tri-Valley United Democratic Campaign, which is the fundraising arm um, for the Tri-Valley area of the Alameda County um, Democratic Party. So uh, right now we have $8,000 in our coffers and I have a commitment for at least three or $4,000 right now for this fundraiser. Um, please come out and see us, buy a ticket. Um, it's a good time to come out and meet all the different candidates, talk to people. And if you are running for office, we really want your endorsements and your sponsorships. And we will, if you get the endorsement of the Central Committee, the UDCs go to work for you and help your campaign. So with that, I'm going to now turn this, I'm gonna stop the recordings. I'm gonna, hold on, stop my recording.